Welcome everyone. Well, um, apparently it's the last hooray on Monday <laughs> Memorial Day and we'll actually have more people attend the events. But I have to say we are having a really great turnout on uh, Facebook on the live stream. Uh, up to 100 people um, on some of these events. And uh, obviously people that can't make it out here actually get to hear these fabulous uh, panellists talk. So. Um, not everyone's missing out. Um, I'd like to introduce Sean Flynn first. Um, and Sean has been kind enough to uh, offer uh, the venue to us and we love the people here at Tech Code even when they leave, <laughs> like Becky did. Um, and uh, he's just gonna talk a little bit about Tech Code. Thank you for the intro. Um, we're thrilled to have Pamela put on an event here. She does one about once a month. Um, we're always excited to have more and more. So if anyone here has an event that they want to do to help the startup ecosystem, please talk to me. Uh, my cards are at the front desk. Also, if anyone wants to get involved more with the, with the startups here in our incubator or accelerator, we're always looking for mentors, service providers, or anyone that can actually help the startups grow, which is pretty much anything. So um, please reach out to us. Also, if you know of any startups that are interested in going overseas, landing in other markets, especially into China, that's where we have a lot of value uh, that, that we can give based on our locations there and who our parent company is. So please reach out to me. My name's Sean Flynn. My card's up front. And thanks, everyone, for coming today. Uh, I look forward to this event. Thanks, Sean. Um, tonight we've got um, some great VCs, uh, David I know and Ma I've just met tonight. Um, and fantastic, we've got Dean Takahashi from VentureBeat, who is um, a well-known celeb in the ecosystem. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Dean, and you can introduce yourself and let the VCs introduce themselves. Good, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dean Takahashi. I am the lead writer for GamesBeat at VentureBeat. Uh, I cover the games industry maybe 80% 80 of my time. 20% is sort of like everything else in Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, and I've been doing it for about 25 years, uh, last nine years at VentureBeat. Uh, we have our own events. Uh, our next uh, GameSpeed event uh, happens on October 5th and 6th in San, Fr San Francisco. And, um, uh, you know, it... it, it, it it is interesting to, to cover games, but also to sort of get outside of it once in a while. And I'm happy to be doing a lot of that tonight. Um, and I'm going to have uh, our guests uh, introduce themselves more. Uh, first, uh, Mar Perez from InCube Ventures. Uh, tell Hi us there. more about yourself. Uh, Hi there. Uh, thank you for having me here. Pleasure to be here tonight. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, so my name is Mar Perez. I'm originally from Spain. Uh, my background is in business. I studied my degree in Madrid, Spain, and also UK, one year there. And then I decided to make my personal dream true, so I went to Australia. I finished my degree, I bought a ticket, and I, I left for Sydney. I lived there for a year, loved it. Um, then I came back and I started working in Johnson & Johnson, and I fell in love with healthcare. Uh, before that, I was working a little bit on marketing. It was okay, it was enough, nothing like exciting. Like, but when I started working in healthcare, I thought, wow, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I, I love it. It was just so meaningful. Um, so then I really want to come here and work in Silicon Valley and connect health, healthcare and IT. And Silicon Valley was my professional dream. So I thought, how can I make this happen? So I started an MBA, which was international, part in Madrid in Spain and part in California, UCR in Riverside. So I did that, and then I worked in a, in a, as an internship in a, a startup in Palo Alto called HealthTap. And when I finished that, um, I really want to make it happen. So I started just connecting with people, uh, networking a lot, attending to any single conference I could. And I heard of uh, one of the partners in my fund. I connect with him as I connected with so many other people. I have so many coffees. And finally, after talking to them, to, to his partner, to, you know, to le learning more about the group and the projects and what they're working on, and I could see myself adding value uh, with this team. It's called Incube Ventures, and they could see that as well, of course, so otherwise I wouldn't be with them. And that was four years ago, and since then I'm here. And also, just mentioned really quickly that they sponsored me to do the, the Kaufman Fellow program. Uh, so I graduated last year. And I, I, I was uh, lucky enough to have uh, David come in to talk in one of the modules. And it was a great experience. And I feel very fortunate to, for being here, for being a Kaufman Fellow, and, 
and for, for being a VC as well. Great. And David. Yeah. David hey, Hornick. David August Hornick Capital. from August Capital. Uh, love the Kaufman Fellows. I'm a huge fan and uh, always feel grateful when they let me uh, come and pontificate. They basically let me come in because uh, I am far too honest about the venture business. So all the other people who are sort of like, oh yeah, it's always great and every company works. And then I come in and tell the truth, so that's good. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I, I got a degree in computer music. That didn't really qualify me for anything. Then I got a master's in criminology. That didn't really qualify me for anything. And then I got a law degree. That qualified me to be a lawyer. Uh, and after six years of practicing law, I had the, uh, by the way, right now this gentleman is turning me down because I am so loud. <laughs> My family is all thinking to themselves, I wish we had that dial. I don't really got to turn that down. Anyway, I got a law degree. I practiced. I was a litigator in New York for a while. Then I came out here, and in, in 1997, I came out to the Bay Area because my uh, freshman dorm mate, uh, Jer Jerry Yang, had started Yahoo, and a bunch of our friends from the dorm were working at Yahoo, and the internet was emerging. I thought, that's pretty amazing. And I started working representing startups, and at that moment realized that startups were completely shockingly great. Uh, that bunch of smart people trying to solve hard problems. And when they did, they changed the planet. And you know there just weren't a whole lot of jobs that related to that. And so I represented startups for a period of time. And in 2000, had the good fortune of being asked by the partners at August Capital uh, to become a VC. And they said, you know what, David, lawyers suck at this. And you'll probably fail. But we kind of like you. <laughs> so come on and join us. And I thought, perfect, I'm in. You know, Count me in. Uh, so I joined August in uh, June of 2000, prompting the complete destruction of the public markets. Uh, but it's been an amazing time. I've been so I've been been at August ever since, 17 years now, and uh, it's a, it's an amazing job. You get to work with an incredible group of entrepreneurs and see you know see people build businesses that transform how we live our lives. And I think that's I consider that a very lucky thing. Interesting. Uh, so I'm, I'm very off course already, though, and I, I think uh, I'll ask uh, maybe, uh, was, it, was there something in your background then that prepared you uh, for this VC job? Like uh, <laughs> something that, you know, you felt like that was good training to be doing what I'm doing today? That's a good question. Um, to be completely honest, I never planned to be a VC. I never did that. So. I think I'm very good. I'm not that great at planning exactly what I want from here, you know, from right now in 10 years, but I'm very good at escaping out of the things that I don't want. Like, you know. Like this and panel, important. and she's out of here. Yeah, no, but it's important. So <laughs> narrow down the options, saying, okay, this is just not for me, you know? So let's say you are in a position where you see the people, you know, your progression could be that person there, right, in the company. And you feel, okay, but I don't want that. So I don't want that in five years. I don't want that in 10 years. So what am I doing here? So I think, you know, uh, being honest with yourself, um, just trying to figure out what you want in life is hard. Um, be consistent. That would be the thing. It's more than a skill. I mean, it's, I guess it's a personal skill, right? But being very stubborn. I'm the, the youngest of seven kids, so. You can imagine how stubborn I am. I mean, it's just, there's no other way, you know? Like your parents, so that you have four kids, right? Yeah. So imagine, th three more, you don't even no, remember. I can't even imagine. You don't even remember when I was born. Like, yeah, you know, 11, 12, something in between. Do they know where you are? They're like, oh, I wonder where she went. They, you she know, was in Spain, and now she's gone. She's like, yeah, she was in the UK, Australia, you know, now she's in the US. Not sure what she's doing, you know, but, you know. I mean, all they care is, have you had food today? Are you sleeping well? Are you happy? That's all, you know? That's, That's good. all they care. Anyway, so be persistent. I would, I would choose that one. Yeah. Uh, David, same for you. Did something yeah. train you for this life? No. So my, uh, I, I remember having a conversation with my mother after uh, I had taken this job as a venture capitalist, and I'm on the phone with my mom, and she's like, "What's a venture cap?" Hey, hey, mom, I'm super excited. I'm a venture capitalist now. She's like, "What's a venture capitalist?" And I sort of tried to explain it, and she said, "So let me get this straight. You talked your way into a job that only involves talking." And I said, yes. And she said, it's perfect. That's perfect. That's perfect for you. So that's it, right? I mean, basically, it's, oh, here's an opportunity. I, I will say that the one thing, 
I, I learned this particular thing very clearly from a professor of mine uh, at Stanford who ra he ran this guy named Cannell Jackson who ran the storm. And Cannell was a wonderful, amazing guy. But what I learned from Cannell, he was so curious, intellectually curious about everything. Everywhere we went, Cannell would ask people like, oh, those, are those comfortable shoes? And, you know, what's that soul made out of? And he'd be like, oh, so you were the one of seven, you know, what'd you do in preschool? Or he just would ask everybody everything. It was amazing. And it was just an incredible reminder that every person you encounter has some unique piece of information that is either interesting or fun or super valuable. And in the venture business, that's 100% true. Like, be intellectually curious, spend the time. Right now, 17 years in, I've probably had, you know, let's call it 100 meetings a year of people pitching me. That's 1,700 hours of people kind of telling you about what they're working on. So I think that that, you know, the desire to just sort of be curious and, and interested in what people are working on has served me really well. Cool. So what are uh, some successful investments or, or, or ones that just stand out to you as very memorable or, I guess, um, you know, successful or not, I guess? But. <laughs> well, that's a very different question, just for the record. You're like, oh, they, that one was remember, memorable and what a shit show. Like, no. uh, Remember in a bad way, right? Anyway. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you've been at it for a relatively short time, and so have you had the the pleasure of sort of seeing things blossom yet, or is it too early? Um, so I didn't choose these deals, so it's not my, you know, to my credit, it wasn't me, but um, I was fortunate to see how they, they were, you know, uh, memorable in a good way. Uh, so let me give you some examples. One of them is, um, this company is called Rani Therapeutics, so it's changing li uh, patient's life. It's uh, convertible injectable into pills. Um, the valuation right now is 1.1 billion. It's becoming the unicorn of the fund. We partner with uh, the top pharma companies, uh, Novartis and AstraZeneca. And uh, you know that's a good example of an investment that is just rocking. It's, uh, it's, it's just the baby of the fund. We're so excited. There's actually, we have news and it's very exciting, but I just cannot share that now because it's <laughs> confidential, so I'll hold it. That's one. Another would be a company called, um, just thinking about the portfolio companies we have. Uh, it's called um, Spinal Modulation. That was a successful acquisition, uh, St. Jude Medical acquired. Um, that company is a medical device company, uh, neurostimulation for chronic pain, which is a huge problem. And it was acquired for over 500 million by St. Jude. So that's another successful uh, example. And we co-invested with uh, Medtronic and Johnson & Johnson. So that's uh, another important thing to you know, be in the table with the right people and syndicate uh, correctly. Um, the third one would be a company in women's health. It's called Channel Me System. We actually just closed the last financing in the, uh, two weeks ago. That was Series C1, and it was 14.1 million. Um, again, uh, Boston Scientific is on the table, so co-investing. Um, that would be three examples that, yeah, again, it's not my, it wasn't my pick, just the, the people I work with, uh, so I'm proud and I have to share it. But um, I'm looking into one deal right now. And I'm going to have dinner with them tonight. So I'm very excited about that one. I'm of looking course. around the room. Yeah. They're not here. <laughs> They're, not here. They're not here. They're not here. Smile widely <laughs> if you're that deal. <laughs> They're not. But um, yeah, that's exciting. And obviously, I can't share too much. But um, you know, it's just um, it's a company that I click with them. I don't know if I found them or they found me or we found each other, but it was in a conference. And uh, as soon as I started listening to, to this, this, this founder talking, I thought, well, that's, that's a great idea. I love them. I love the, I get to know the co-founder. I get to know everybody, you know, I, we just, just clicked. It's just a click, you know. And when that happened, you go to sleep and you're still thinking about that company and about the team and about the potential. And it's just, uh, it's like an obsession. So we're there right now. Yeah, we'll see what happens. And David, your successful investments? I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm not nearly as in love as, <laughs> like, oh my God, I need that. I need, <laughs> I need, to, be experience. I need to be smitten again. <laughs> uh, you know, I think the venture business is sort of an amazing thing in the sense that I, I invest quite early, and, and so they're all, you know, it's always exciting, but it's a little roller coastery exciting. Like, you know, sometimes you're on the way up, and sometimes you're on the way down. Uh, 
I have a couple of companies now that are doing super exciting things. Uh, one is a company called Fastly, which is a content distribution network. Uh, but it's actually doing much more interesting stuff at the edge. So they're really, uh, think of them as an edge cloud. You can do all sorts of interesting compute things at the edge with Fastly uh, in ways that one couldn't with an Akamai or, or some al alternative. Um, and so it's, you know, what's exciting about a Fastly is for one, it's growing quickly and doing, and doing great stuff, but also you get to see the team get built, you get to see the messaging grow, you get to see it impact uh, customers, customers like the Twitters and Airbnbs of this world. So um, anyway, so I, I think that in, in, you know, the new companies like a Fastly or Bill.com, which is also a, just a very thoughtfully built, uh, you know, amazing group of people, um, and in every instance, I'm sort of hoping that it'll be the ne my next Splunk, which has been the, the company that has had the greatest, you know, grown from the greatest scale. I funded three founders with an interesting idea, and today it's, I don't know, maybe 3,000 people and, a, and a, a $9 billion public company, and that's incredible. Like it's, I actually think it's magic that that ever happens. Um, <laughs> But honestly, like the little ones growing from 2 million to 10 million in revenue or growing from seven people to 70 people uh, is sort of just as thrilling. So here's the sort of question of the night, uh, like uh, what catches your attention and uh, what are the hallmarks of good pitches? Mm. To that, are uh, we going? David, why yeah. you start? You want me to? Uh, you, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, what catches my attention? Uh, I don't know. You know, it's fu it's funny. There, there, there's sort of this temptation to like, oh, I'm going to stand out by doing something different, right? Oh, I'm not going to use a PowerPoint, or I'm going to sing a song, or I'm going to whatever. Um, and those things absolutely stand out, but they usually don't stand out in a good way. So, uh, so maybe that's not the greatest uh, greatest um, plan. I think in the end. Being thoughtful is what stands out, right? In the end, what we're looking for, what I'm looking for, is someone who has discovered some opportunity that I have never thought, that people have not thought about, and that is uniquely situated to transform some part of our lives, right? And all the best companies have done that. They've all come up with something that, you know, in many ways was obvious, right? Oh, that's obvious, and yet they've, they've pinpointed the issue and they created the solution. And the thing that captures your attention is really smart entrepreneurs who, when you ask them questions about their business, they have great answers and they get more, more excited. Mars point is exactly right. Like, the thing that's exciting is to go to bed thinking about a new business that you hadn't thought about, right? Mm -hmm. you, we all go to bed and there's some period of time where we're like between lying down and falling asleep. And you can think about your kids, or you can think about the economy, or you can think about whatever. But if you think about that entrepreneur who's pitched you that morning, man, they've done a great job, mm -hmm. right? They've, they've captured your attention and your excitement, and, and, they've, and they've made you think about the future. So um, that's a hard thing to do. And there isn't like some prescription to do it. Oh, you have to do these sets of things. But if you can achieve that, uh, you're, you're well on your way to uh, dinner with Mar tonight. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, what catch uh, your yeah, attention about a pitch? your attention and what are the hallmarks of good pitches? Like good if, pitches. If there's a pattern you yeah. see in what you like, mm. I guess. Or... Got it. Thank you. Um, uh, completely agree with you. Um, I think uh, this uh, very, unfortunately, is not that common to find that balance between someone who has a lot of knowledge about a topic, he's passionate, a lot of knowledge, but at the same time is humble and thoughtful, you know, common sense. Usually, I see a lot of talented people, you know, amazing, you know, qualification, degrees, Harvard, Stanford, okay, I don't care. Um, <laughs> but then they talk about something and it just, uh, there's something off, you know, like, and just, uh, I don't know, I think it's just good to be humble and, and relaxed and thoughtful and, you know, sometimes you don't have everything figured it out, and that's okay. I love when someone, I was talking, you know, to her before about this, this topic, no? Like when somebody is an entrepreneur doesn't have an, a question, and they say, you know what, I don't know. I don't remember, I don't know exactly that data. Let me get back to you, and then they do it. I love that, yeah. I love that. Seriously, don't make it up, don't pretend you know it, and answer a different thing. Just say you don't know, and then come back, check it out, and come back to me, and I love that, you know? So, 
course, the obvious, right? Having a good idea, presenting well, uh, being prepared, domain expertise, but also thoughtful. I, I think that's, that's huge, just thoughtful, you know? Hmm. So, you know, in some ways, I guess journalism and uh, venture capital investing seem similar in that we're trying to absorb a lot of things coming in at us, right? And mm -hmm. I'm kind of always at a loss myself to figure out how to, what's the best way for me to be productive. Like, should I look at all 500 emails that came in today? Or should I get out of the office and go meet people or go network or whatever, right? So uh, for you, I guess, um, you know, what, what do you find to be a productive use of your time when it comes to finding what you need to find? Like, you're, you're looking for that needle in a haystack, like, like a lot of other people, but, you know, how do you, how do you productively do it? I think, I, I swear, I ask that question myself every day. Every day, seriously. It's like, I think we are so overloved with information. It's just brutal. It's just overwhelming. I mean, it's just, everything goes so fast. So fast. I just came from, from Spain. It seems like it was a year ago. Uh, from holidays, two weeks there. And I swear, when I go there, I'm in shock. But how slow everything goes. <laughs> it's just crazy. And when I come back here, exactly the opposite. It's like how fast everything goes. So how can you be more productive? And how can you actually absorb? How can you focus on the right things? How can you, you know, I would love to spend time with all the entrepreneurs, have a coffee with everyone, you know, and listen and learn more about their companies and their, I would love to, but I cannot, I have no time. So how do you pick, how do you select well? How do you prioritize? I, every time I think about it, I have to stop, um, you know, just uh, I think the fact that you're willing to, 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 you know, to force yourself to focus on the priorities is a good point. Sometimes you can do it, sometimes it's not that easy. And then I have a paper on my, on my desk. It just say two words, big picture. So my problem is I tend to focus too much. I start analyzing and I enter into a loop that, you know, you, you, you're wasting time. There's a point where you have to stop. You can't know everything about something and just get deep and get lost. You know, put a time. Okay, I have 30 minutes to do this, kind of frame the time. At 30 minutes, if I'm not done by 10 p.m., I'm sorry, I have to move forward, you know? So that's what I do, just remind myself, uh, you can set alarm, there, there are even apps, of course, there's an app for it. So <laughs> there is an app that it has a timer on it, so after 20 minutes, it, you have to close it. You have to change whatever you're doing, and even in your laptop, it switch off, literally, <laughs> if you're after five, five, 25 minutes. So, I don't know, just think about the big picture, what am I doing, what is more important, what is the priority, and as you said before, is it worth it to be back and forward on emails and calls, or should you just set an appointment and go talk to that person? Just wonder, think, um, and put out. And Dave, have you used those 1,700 hours productively? <laughs> <laughs> Almost assuredly not. <laughs> No, I, you know, this is exactly the, the challenge. It's a question. But the, I, the good news, bad news for me is I'm dyslexic. And so actually, you know, I could read forever and I'd get nowhere. <laughs> so I have to, I need another strategy because that's not going to work for me. Um, and so in the end, actually, those 1,700 hours are exactly the most productive use of my time because the way I get all information is from other people, right? It's from reach as... Everybody who pitches me, whether I fund your business or not, you're going to share some interesting fact with me, right? I remember the, the first pitch I heard where someone said, you know, the number two search engine in the world is, is YouTube, right? I didn't know that at that time. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it ch shifts your perspective completely. Like, okay, wait a second. You have Google, and then you have YouTube, and then you have everything else. Now, I do wonder at this point, is it Facebook? And if it is, why they don't fix their search? But that's a whole other question, right? But it's these conversations that you have. And then when you get excited about a business, then you dig in further. So you have this first hour, then you have another hour, another hour, another hour. And I inevitably then say, who do I know who knows something about this, right? Um, when, I, when I was looking at this company, WePay, which is a, a payments company, Two very smart but very young and non and ter terribly unqualified uh, entrepreneurs. They'd never done anything in the fin financial services space, but they were really great. And I said, this is a great idea. How can I validate it? And so what I did is I introduced them to a guy named Eric Dunn, who had been one of the very earliest Intuit people. And Eric sat down and spent time with them. And I introduced him to a guy named Scott Loftusness, who had been the CTO of Visa. And I said, would you mind hearing the story? Let me know what you think. They met with the 
this company, and they came back and shared their thoughts with me, and both of them said, hey, by the way, can we invest? And it was like, all right, now we're on to something, right? So mm -hmm. what is the path to get to the core question and, the, mm -hmm. and get to the most valuable insight? And the answer is experts are always that way, and people are always the answer. Mm -hmm. So moving along on, on our list here, how is venture capital changing? It's not, it's exactly the same. <laughs> Don't change. <All> right. <laughs> so, um, on my perspective, again, you know, life science, healthcare, um, you can see that people talk all the time about how tech, you know, uh, capital uh, requirement for tech is going down, you know, it's decreasing. I think for life science, it's just the opposite. It's just going up, it continues going up. Um, our sector is very highly regulated, it's just tough. Um, the reimbursement is key and it's still hard to navigate. Um, talking about FDA, it seems to be more clear now about guidances, for example, obesity. So it's, it's, that's something good, it's a good change. And um, I would say also, you know, in my group, we are seeing more capital flowing from Asia. I, I was actually talking about that with someone before. Uh, so we're, you know, we're having more capital from China, for example. We also bring in more capital from, from the East Coast, Boston and New York. Um, but um, yeah, I think you're gonna answer this question um, from a different perspective because I focus a little on you know, life science, so. <laughs> I know, you, you actually have to know things. That's hard. Uh, yeah, I mean, the venture business always is changing and it's always staying exactly the same, right? You know, uh, Andreessen Horowitz shows up, we're gonna build a big new firm and we're gonna hire all these people and they're gonna provide services and it's a whole new thing, isn't that amazing? Except that in the late 90s, Draper Fisher Jurvetson was providing a bunch of services. Other people, you know, Idea Lab was creating a bunch of services. There was nothing new about it. It's just that people had forgotten about it because it didn't work that well in the first instance. And so they built it, you know, oh, we're gonna make it work. And you know, and then a set of other firms said, oh, we better get and do that. And they then built it up. And you know, Angel, there was a, there was very little angel funding, and then 1997, 98, 99, angel funding became uh, became really lucrative and lots and lots of people entered the market. And then in 2000, the market went to crap and then all the angel investors disappeared and it became core group. And then Josh Koppelman you know, said, hey, I can create an angel fund. And that created this whole you know, path towards lots and lots of angel funds. And then, uh, you know, and then AngelList was created and crowdfunding was gonna shift the focus. And then, you know, and yet, meanwhile, guess what? For the last 17 years, basically my job has been the same, which is to meet amazing entrepreneurs who need capital to move their businesses forward and are looking for the best possible partner to do that. And I don't mean partner like, oh, you know, who's the best partner? Is it David Hornick or is it Eric Karlborg or whatever? It's who's the best person to partner with us to build this business? And great venture capitalists have always been partners, have always been uh, sat alongside you and tried to help you build your business uh, in lots and lots of ways. And so, you know, the latest claim, and I, I take, uh, you know, is that these uh, ICOs, these initial coin offerings, are going to replace venture capital because, look, you can raise a bunch of money and it's non dilutive and blah, blah, blah. And without getting deeply into this, idea of, of you know it's totally of unregulated too hey wildly unregulated almost assuredly a ponzi scheme like <laughs> let's do it that sounds great um only thing is it has nothing to do with what i do mm. right it's not about what venture capitalists do is they find entrepreneurs who are looking for partners to help them build a big business we trade dollars for equity in the companies and then we all grab an oar and we try and help make that company more valuable that's not at all what anyone does in an ICO. That's not at all what anyone's doing in AngelList. So, so in the end, I think that my job has not changed dramatically, despite the fact that these things sort of come and they go. Okay. And getting, getting back to some pitches, like uh, what are noticeable mistakes in pitches that stand out in your head? Too? Mm. Um. All right. Um, so I would say one thing that gets me a little nervous and I really don't like is when entrepreneurs start going around and 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 it doesn't get the point. It doesn't just make the point. And you can see that on pitches, you can see that on decks as well. So you see a deck, I see from 500 to 1,000 decks per year. I swear, man. some of them, you start looking one page, second page, I have no idea what they're doing. 
It's like four page. We look at each other, the partners and I, like, what? What is what he is just doing? Patient. Take your time. Yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll get to it. They just yeah, they're warming uh, up to it. Yeah, it's not in that way. It's just confusing, <laughs> you know. So I wish it was like anticipation, emotion. <laughs> oh, what do you do? No, it's not that. Uh, but uh, so I would say just um, you know go straight to the point, make it simple, and um, there's always an option to go deeper, right? So you don't have to make start complicated. And and I know in your head, you know, you know, you have a lot of information. It's your baby, so you want to tell everything in five minutes, not gonna happen. So just pick the main points, make it simple, and then we'll ask questions, and we'll make as complicated as we can, <laughs> as we want, you know. Yeah, I think Bar already hit on it, which is there's just no chance that you have all the answers, right? There's just no chance. If, certainly if I'm doing my job well, then what I'm doing is asking questions until I get to the core of what you do know and what you don't know, and so the worst thing you can do is always have an answer because it demonstrates your either your eagerness to please but willingness to lie, or it demonstrates that you don't understand the, the questions at issue. So, so look, be willing to acknowledge when you don't have an answer because that's important. The other thing that I think is, 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 is an incredible confusion for entrepreneurs is that the, that pitch, that first pitch that we have with you you don't have to convince us to give you money. That is not what you're trying to do. What you're trying to do is get us to have another meeting, mm. right? You're just trying to get us excited and interested enough in what you're doing that you say, oh my God, that's super interesting. Why don't you meet my partners? Or that was very interesting. I'd love to have a cup of coffee and discuss this particular thing or whatever. The number of times in the last 17 years that I that an entrepreneur has come in and in a single pitch convinced us to give him or her money, I think I could count on a, a couple of fingers, right? It's just not what happens. What happens is that you tell, you meet Mar at a, at a conference, you describe what you're doing, she says, oh, that's interesting, you have this conversation that's super engaging, you probably then sit down and have lunch with them, mm -hmm. And then that night, you go to bed and think like, oh my god, what if this, and that's kind of interesting, whatever. And the next morning, you email them and say, hey, let's catch up and have a follow-up conversation. That's success, not like, let me give you a bunch of money. Like, just, that just never happens. Yeah. Um, let's see. I, I think I just checked to see if the audience has some questions here. Um, you guys uh, burning to ask anything in particular? OK, here we go. Hi, I'm Brahman. Uh, I'm curious to find out when you have been really close to investing and something told you not to go forward and you regret it. And we regret it? That's so mean. <laughs> I mean, I could list all the companies that I may or may not have been close to, but I didn't fund and regret, like, you know, Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'd say as a partnership, the one that, that um, that we completely messed up. I mean, there are, there are plenty that we completely messed up. But uh, Airbnb is a really great example of this, where the Airbnb founders came in. They described for us a business that was compelling. It was very early. But you look at it and go, oh, that's a super compelling business. And then you inevitably dig in to say, OK, so what are the things that could go wrong? right? And the thing that my partnership got caught on was this idea that sometime there would be some catastrophic thing that happened in an Airbnb. Someone would be murdered or raped, something would be destroyed or whatever, and then what? And it was this seed of doubt that snuck in and caused us to ultimately uh, step away from investing. Um, well, needless to say, that was a profoundly wrong instinct. Um, but the problem actually with venture investing is that even the companies you fund, you have that moment, right? Even the ones you fund, you go through it and say, well, mm. oh my god, but what if this set of things happened? That would be terrible. <laughs> that would be terrible. I, I just funded a company in the Internet of Things space. It's like a, it's literally a piece of hardware. It's, and it couldn't be in a more crowded space, but you know, we saw the pitch, like the company, like the idea. I'm in the process of giving them Maybe I have already given them many millions of dollars, but I can assure you that every day I'm like, oh no, another one that's competing. Or, oh my God, you know, that hardware will never actually get made. <laughs> or, you know, they're like, so 
it's like a constant state for us, right? You're just in a constant state of uh, regret, panic, mm. sadness, horror. It's awesome. <laughs> it's incredible. Mar, how about you? Um, so I, having had this, the, the, the situation of regretting about something, but I can tell you uh, a reason why you know, I've seen the partnership uh, considering uh, investing in one company and walking back, and that was rush. The entrepreneur was rushing us. That's not good. So life science, you need to do diligence. Due diligence are hard, you know, it's just complex. So if somebody come and say, hey, I need the money and I need it ja, uh, uh, now. Sorry, Spanish come out. <laughs> ja. I need it now. It's a little like, oof, well, you know, uh, maybe we wait for the next round, right? So sometimes rushing, timing is important. And rushing can be very bad, you know? Momentum is interesting, but rushing, is, uh, is this a really thin line in between? Momentum is awesome and you have to use it, right? Like you're in or out. But rushing too much and pushing too much, that's careful with that but one. How does that sort of sync with the, the problem of everything's moving too fast, as, as you noted earlier, right? Uh, is everybody trying to rush you now? Um, mm, you know, like, no, really. No, no. I don't think we have that of rushing. Again, I think life science is just slower than others, you know? I think tech is way faster, right? Like you have to make the call. Like I can imagine someone in life science say in the first meeting, I want you to, you know, to, to come in. Like uh, we have so many questions. So. So, David, um, I was interested in your comment about Andreessen. Um, I've got this little philosophy about the whole Hollywood model that happened. So I've been here just over seven years and I've noticed a really big change in the ecosystem, being on the gra grassroots as I am. And um, I wondered what your overview is, because of your experience, um, of how that model has affected all the VC firms. I have other VC friends who have said that everyone's racing to keep up with that Hollywood model. And, and now when I do events, even VCs that I know, not yourself, <laughs> but others, I have to go through PR people who know nothing <laughs> and who uh, I put everything in writing and then they have to have a call and I have to go through it all again. And then they say, oh, we can't make a decision yet because it's too risky to say yes or no, right? And in the end, I go back to the person and I'm like, this person's wasting my time, you know? <laughs> so that, you know, that's just me and the grassroots level. And uh, the other thing that I'm noticing is that when I came that first year and did that project and interviewed you as one of the VCs, Everyone told me that it's always good to speak to a VC before you need funding. It's always good to get to know VCs before you get funded um, because then you're not desperate <laughs> and because then you know the lay of the land and the right people to go to. These days it's harder for entrepreneurs to have access. My events are very different and that's part of why I run them. Uh, I like people to be able to network with the VCs. but. Um, generally, TechCrunch disrupt and all of those, everyone's kept very separate. Mm. And again, um, I actually, we live streamed an event for a meetup and um, Scott Kapoor spoke with Fireside Chat. Now, I heard him on a Girls in Tech event years ago, many years ago in San Francisco. And he was just one of the panellists and he was interesting. This one, a PR gal, from Andreessen had to go through all the questions before he could answer them, and it was the most boring conversation I've ever had to sit through. <laughs> so, like, ouch! This this is right <laughs> down here. I obviously, I'm on the grassroots, and you know, I'm not in the same place as the VCs. But I have spoken to some of my friends, and they say that has been a big change. And I wondered what your perspective is on that, considering you just spoke earlier. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, look at. I can't think of a less enviable job than being a PR person who was supposed to control me in any way. Like that would be that would be <laughs> a fool's errand. <laughs> so that's I know. Uh, but uh, look, there are there are certainly advantages to having having great people help you build businesses. Right. One of the things that the Andreessen model has done that has been wildly successful is. They have a center where they introduce their companies to corporate partners who come in and, and, and build a bunch of relationships. And I think that's been great, right? Now, the interesting thing is 
that I think we all, that, that's what we all do, right? I mean, obviously one of the roles I have as a venture investor is to make sure that I have a set of these relationships so that when my companies want to meet folks from a Cisco or an Oracle or a Procter & Gamble or a Home Depot or whatever it is, I have the ability to introduce them. Um, it's just that Andreessen and others have started systematizing that. And so, um, but on the whole, what I would say is my model and the model, the traditional venture model is, let me give you money and advice and introduce you to amazing people and let you build that expertise within your own company. No matter what, if you're successful, you need to have that expertise yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like saying you, one of your companies is gonna have a chief medical officer mm -hmm. who's part of your firm and you know, comes in and helps out. Like, that's not gonna work. You need to, mm -hmm. you know, your drug discovery, you need your own chief medical officer. And if you're building an enterprise software company, you need your own sales force, you need your own business development people, et cetera. So, you know, the companies that are the most successful ultimately will not take great advantage of that stuff because they'll build amazing teams themselves. And so I'm looking for teams who are going to take advantage of advice and help, but they're gonna build incredible organizations. And so it's not that I don't think that model can work. It's, it's just that I think my, I, I would rather back folks who are gonna build those organizations themselves. Um, so I'm, I, uh, I love everybody. <laughs> I just love August Capital a little bit more. <laughs> mm, um, so I, I wonder uh, how you would sort of finish this sentence. Uh, I wish more entrepreneurs would do. The Macarena. <laughs> no. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I wish more entrepreneurs. It depends on every particular case, right? Like, every entrepreneur has to face their own uh, challenges, right? And for some of them, it might be more you know, straight to the point. For some other, might be more persistent. For some other, um, I would say being a specific. So for example, following up right, with VCs, um, I think it's, it's a great idea to be specific. Instead of just sending an email, hey, Mar, let's just catch up, have a coffee, or how did you say that? I want to pick your brain or pick? Pick your brain, right? Yeah, that's like, man, I pick my brain about what? I mean, <laughs> let's just go to the point, right? So being specific, I would say it's a good one. But again, depends on what is what they are facing and what is the main problem they, are, they have or what is what they're doing <laughs> that it could be better done, that they could improve. David? Who am I to wish anything of entrepreneurs? I, I wish, uh, you know, I, I, I wish that I'd get to see all these great entrepreneurs and may have the good sense to fund them. <laughs> I certainly think that's, ca that's the case. I mean, in the end, um, I wish nothing but the best for, for entrepreneurs because it is incredibly hard. And, yeah. and I think Mar's right. Like, in the end, each entrepreneur faces some different challenge. And it may be, you know, I, had, I backed this incredibly smart young uh, team that built a business that got to over $100 million in revenue in a relatively short period of time. It was like, this, is, this company is a winner. I was counting the money. And then the market shifted in a way that, that basically undercut their business. And they went from you know, $110 million in revenue to 60 to you know, good luck. And so I wish they had better luck with the market. <laughs> I wish that, you know, and so each person encounters sort of a different thing. And, and the one thing I would say is like, look, ultimately, the only thing that's fatal when you're building a business is running out of capital. So entrepreneurs would be really well served to understand that they need to stay capitalized and that when one has the opportunity to raise money, you know, do so, uh, and, and, uh, and you'll be in a much better, stronger position. More questions from anybody? I have a different question. Like it's a, something completely different about the international markets. So do you guys ever look uh, at international like all US companies? I know it has its own challenges because they're not here. But do you ever do that? And in under what conditions if you do, mm -hmm. uh, if you do uh, consider them, let's say? So I'll answer first. Yeah, please. And um, yes, the answer is yes. We look. Um, so it just happened that we have invested only in the US so far with the two funds we have. We are fundraising the third one now. Now, we do see companies all over. And um, also to say that before uh, we were talking about entrepreneurs 
finding the VCs and talking to them before they need the money? I think we should do the same. VCs, we're fundraising. That's not an excuse to stop talking to people and to keep an eye on what's going on out there. So even if you know we have been fundraising, I always like to be in the loop, what is going on, you know, talk to people here and outside. So um, I think life science is a very small circle in the valley. So we talk to each other all the time. You know, it's uh, pretty common to have a deal coming from somewhere. Um, Mexico, for example, so I'm from Spain, of course, uh, Spanish language uh, from Latin America, Mexico. I see deals all the time from there. Um, we see deals in many, many places. Now, to invest in those deals, uh, they have to be amazing idea, great team, blah, blah, blah. But also, we have to know a little bit about the place where we are investing. So that's important. Um, probably having someone there helps a lot. Um, also, happen, for example, with the Kaufman Fellowship Program, we are from all over the world. We are so, so that's very helpful to talk to them, to talk to a fellow, you know, say, hey, I'm looking to that company, tell me more about it, do you know them? So it's just easier to invest in the US for us because it's where we have the networking and the expertise. Um, you know, it's just, it's happened to be easier, so but. You have concerns, for example, that the management team is in this other country. So let's say you invest in that company, but the CEO is in Mexico City or in Barcelona or in Madrid. Mm. Is that a concern at all uh, in terms of having to deal with them and be close to them? I mean, if you ask me, would I prefer to have the CEO here in San Francisco? Yes. Now, is that a problem not to invest? No. If it's worth it, we'll have it there. I'll go there. I mean, I'm more than happy to go to Spain to talk to the CEO. I also have people there. So that's not a problem. We jump in a plane, we go there, we keep continuing communication. You know, you can have video conferences with them. You can just keep it alive. Um, yeah, if it's worth it, you'll do it. In my firm, if it's worth it, we'll invest outside of the US, yes. It sounds very different from uh, the VCs of the past, where you know, 50 mile radius was was usually the uh, the answer, I guess. Yeah, well, 50 mile radius these days takes you about. You could fly to Chicago in the time that it would take you to drive a 50 mile radius in <laughs> no the one area, so <laughs> you might as well just hop on it. Uh, yeah, so I, I just funded a company in Chicago. Does that count? No. Uh, it's close, it's close, right? We're getting there. Uh, look, in the end, we're all looking for great companies. So, so have you invested in all US companies? In, companies? Yeah, yeah, we have. So we, now I'm, we have a number of companies in Canada right now. Now, if they're in Vancouver, they might as well be in Seattle. If they're in Toronto, it's a, fur, it's a bigger deal. Mm -hmm. In either instance, the, the language and culture and all of those things make it pretty consistent. Uh, but we in, we've invested in companies in Israel. We invested in a company relatively recently in Germany. So we're, we're perfectly happy to invest in companies that, that we believe have the cap capacity to, be, uh, to, to get to an outsized outcome. What I would say is the, the bar is much higher, right? Because when you think about it, I'm sitting on a bunch of boards. The, the, the amount of time it takes me just to be available and helpful to a company in Germany is much greater than, to, than one in San Jose. Uh, you know, I can go to two board meetings in a day that are in the, the Bay Area, and I can go to one board meeting in three days that's in Munich. Uh, so that doesn't mean we won't do it, because the reality is we're always looking for an amazing company. In the, in the end, Spotify had no problem raising capital. But Spotify had to very high bar, and there were many, many companies like it that didn't raise capital because people thought, I've seen businesses that are just as compelling locally. I'd much rather do that. Mm. Where's Spotify from? Uh, uh, yeah, somewhere in Scandinavia. Oh, okay. I didn't know. So do you find like you have more challenges with your companies in Israel and Germany than the ones? Yeah. No, we have equal number of challenges with all of them, which is infinite. So, you know, I mean, I don't, the good news for me is I don't really sleep that much, so time zones aren't really a problem. If you don't sleep, then time zones are irrelevant. Uh, but you know, you always have these. There are all sorts of cha challenges uh, being far away. Um, the other thing is you want to be helpful to help build a team. And so I just don't have that many relationships in Germany. I have more relationships in the London area, but I certainly have infinitely more relationships here in the Bay Area or in Los Angeles, or even in Chicago and New York. And so. Um, 
So in the end, you're just trying to figure out how you can be the most, most useful while investing in the companies that you think have the capacity to be really massive. So can we play this game where we turn the tables? So what, give us your pitch to us as entrepreneurs and give us your pitch to us as potential LPs. What would they do? Yeah, sure. I mean, we do, we do that every day, right? It turns out this is the thing. Entrepreneurs think like, oh my God, venture capitalists. They sit around and they judge us all day and then they never have to worry about it. Well, here's the dirty little secret. Like I spend, we spend all year, we look at a thousand business plans. We meet with a hundred. We get serious about 20. We fund a, a deal or two, right? So imagine you go through this year, you have found the one company you want to fund and then they have a term sheet from three other venture capitalists. Now I'm like, now the table's dramatically turned. It's like, okay, please take my money. Like, <laughs> please. Now, my primary mode is not begging, although I'm not above it by any stretch of imagination. In fact, there was a great entrepreneur who I was uh, trying to convince to take my money once, and he had several term sheets, and I knew that he was gonna make the decision. He had gathered a bunch of information. He said, David, I'm going to make the decision you know, this afternoon or whatever. And I called up his cell phone and I you know, got, reached him on the phone. Hey, Max, it's David. Hey, how are you? I said, I know that you're making this decision. I have to tell you, I feel somewhat powerless because I think you have all the information you have, but I just wanted to call and let you know how much I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he said, David, you could not have made it clearer. And I said, all right, great, I'll catch you later. <laughs> I'll have the phone. But I was sort of sitting there like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Um, my number one pitch to entrepreneurs is here is everyone I've worked with. I literally, if I give you a term sheet, the next thing I send you is a long list of every entrepreneur that I have funded over the last 17 years. Company's done well, company's done poorly, whatever. And I say, reach out to any one of these people and I believe that they will give you a good view of what it's like to work with me. And anyone else who's interested in funding you, ask them for that list and then do the work. Because I was on the Ebates board for 14 years. I've been on the Splunk board for 14 years. Like, if you don't want to hang out with me, after year 11, you're pretty sick of me. You know, maybe after year two. So, and then, in the, and then for, for our limited partners, the first and best you know, answer to that question is, here's all the great companies we've funded and all the money we've given you in the yeah. past. Yeah. Um, but, but more importantly, at the end of the day, it's I've amassed, a, 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 or we've, we've built a partnership of partners who are entrepreneur-centric, who are relationship-centric, who believe that building companies is about building relationships and helping entrepreneurs be successful. August Capital companies, and I use that term extraordinarily loosely, are never described that way. You never would have one of us in a magazine talking about all the things we did for a company. If you, if you interview me about one of my companies, if you interview me about Fastly, what I will say is, Arthur Bergman is an incredible technologist. If you interview me about Bill.com, it's Rene Lassert, is the is has been a life expert in financial services, right? That's what we do, and as a result of that, hopefully all of you say, "Gee, I'd rather work with August. I'd rather work with David Hornick than someone who's going to come in and take the credit. Someone who's going to come in and say that they were the cause of the success." So, it turns out that the combination of, "Hey, we've we've actually made you a ton of money," and by the way, we think that we'll continue to do it by being helpful to the broader ecosystem has been a compelling story for both entrepreneurs and for our LPs now for 20 some odd years of August Capital. Let's hear Mars pitch too. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, did you convince me? <laughs> 100%. So I would say for us, for Incube, um, it would be three things, Expert expertise, um, track record, and the team we have. So healthcare is very hard to navigate. It's just so complex. You have to have the right team. Um, we have been around for 35 years. I'm way newer than that, but that's the team. And you know, that's to talk about. And think about it like when you pitch your company, 
we do that all the time on the fundraising. So we're fundraising right now. I have to pitch the fund all the time, non-stop. All the time, you know? So potential investors, uh, you know, funds, uh, pharma companies, whoever you want to partner with, you, you, I'm doing your job, like exactly the same. I'm pitching, I'm telling, I'm, you know, I'm listening. I, I see how they feel. I see what, why they, you know, don't feel alike, or why, what is, what is, what is not working well. What is it, you know? And who do I, who do I need to go to talk to? What is the profile? What is the kind of group? What is the kind of investor that just align within Q? You know, we're very unique. We have the fund. We also have the lab. So we fund companies ourselves. It's just so unique. So you have to find the right target. I don't know if I should use that word, but you have to find the right people to talk to and then just give it all and pitch it and you know, be prepared for any kind of questions. And if you don't know anything, bring it after. And it's hard, you know. Anybody to give them to give you their money, they're gonna be tough and they're gonna be hard, you know. So so uh, just as far as changes and trends go, um, you know, we've all seen lots of stories lately. Do you think the VC industry is going to become more diverse? I certainly hope so. You know, when I joined the venture industry, I was the diversity because I was under six feet tall. So it was like, <laughs> look at a VC, a little Jewish guy is a venture capitalist. It's miraculous. Uh, so change can happen. Um, but look, in the end, the, th the thing that's going to drive uh, the industry to change is that people like Mar are going to make better investments than we are. And everybody's going to say, like, oh my god, for the, e even, even if I uh, have a ridiculous Neanderthalic point of view, I still want to make more money. <laughs> you know? And it's perfectly clear, the research is perfectly clear, that diversity uh, of background and opinion and uh, and race and sex actually lead to better investments, right? So for sure it is going to change, and the question is who's going to change more quickly? Uh, and the, whoever changes more quickly is going to be the beneficiary of those, of those advantages. Mm. I agree. I mean, you can read the studies proving that. Um, you can find them. It's easy. I will answer the question say that I don't see any reason why it wouldn't change. I just don't see any. I don't see why it wouldn't change. It's going to happen. And it's happening already. So, you know, yeah, I feel very optimistic. I don't, that's how I see it. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure we're we on time check. Uh, one more question? OK, just one more question from the audience here. Can you talk a little bit about how you advise companies that you're looking at to build their staff the different groups you know, in terms of representation. Obviously, product is, is, is paramount, but how they're marketing that product, how they're engaging salespeople, business development folks, how are they going to get that message out there? How do you provide that guidance? Every company is different, right? So, uh, so the first answer is that we look to be helpful to the entrepreneur, but we like to take the lead from the entrepreneur. So I think that in the end, we have, you know, I sit on the boards of the vast majority of the companies that I, that I, uh, in which I invest, and I go to these board meetings monthly or quarterly, et cetera, and we sit around and talk about your business. And so in every one of those board meetings, we have this conversation about, do you have the team to build what you need to build? What is the stage of this business, right? So oftentimes, in the early days, it's not time for uh, you know VP of sales or a head of marketing. It's time to have a head of product. It's time to if you do have a sales lead, it's someone who's out and gathering requirements and being thoughtful, etc. Right. So there's stages of business as always. Right. I just got an email from one of my uh, one of the entrepreneurs I work with who said, "Hey David, we have a great candidate for general counsel. What do you think?" It's like, "Gee, you're a 20 person company." How is that person, you know, how would you put that person to use and we have that conversation? All right, yeah, it's probably not right, not the right time. But we're more likely to have the, gee, I, I, I have this great candidate to be a vice president of sales. And even though we're quite early in the, you know, history of the product, I think that's the right thing to do. And my answer is like, then great, let's hire that person. Mm -hmm. So um, I really look to the entrepreneurs to take, take the lead in these things. Oftentimes what we do uh, sitting on boards or as board observers or working with companies is have that conversation. Then they say, do you have thoughts about who might be a great product lead or who might be a great 
you know, finance person or whatever, and we have lots of that, let me introduce you to so-and-so. Um, but I wouldn't say, I, I would say that I am very rarely the person who is describing an organization, saying here's what's next or here's what we should do. Um, Absolutely agree with the answer, yeah. Uh, we are not supposed to do that job <clears throat> as part of the entrepreneurs. I think we have to support them if they need connections, if they're looking for someone, we can help on that. Um, that's their jobs, though. So they will do that, and if they have any issue, if they have any problem, if they need our help, then we will, but not, I don't think we're supposed to be, you know, uh, the intricism of the VC and the entrepreneur, I think that's, that works well. We're here to help and to support um, when it's needed. Moving forward. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs>